Peter said, there's coming a time when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall yeah. confess that thou art Christ to the glory of God the Father. There'll come a day, Lord, when people understand that you were not just a man, you were God in human flesh. And we appreciate that so much, Lord. May we have an understanding today that leads us deeper with yourself and with each other, Lord, that we might all be one with you and one with each other. And that great love of the Holy Spirit himself in our hearts, shedding abroad himself in his ways, not our ways, but his ways. Lord, grant our fellowship may be in you this morning as we try to walk in the light with the blood of Jesus Christ cleansing us. Give us understanding, Lord. We know that all of us do not have the same understanding, Father, but we know that there is a place where we can have that which casts out all other thoughts but your thoughts, Lord, and then one day we'll come to that complete understanding and perfection. In the meantime, Lord, help us with what we have that we may utilize it fully and live thereby. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> now, uh, this, I think, is the sixth uh, message we're taking in the series of the sermon Brother Brandon preached on Christ revealed in his own word. And by now we see, we have seen, that this message is like many others in that it does not altogether consistently reveal Christ in the scripture or bring him out of the scripture uh, by carefully pointing out uh, the various places in the word where that would be most appropriate but extensively this message brother Branham preached uh, deals with how he is to be revealed and once we know God's way of showing him sitting in the scriptures we can then see him so that's what this scripture this sermon is mainly about not that it does not cover doctrine in certain areas but it does show you how that Christ is revealed in the word that this Bible is completely and a complete revelation of Jesus Christ so that everything in it is either concerning him as to a direct revelation from God about himself or it has to do with people reacting and the course that history has taken so that you understand then it is really a complete revelation of him <clears throat> so far in this message, the highlight of the doctrine is found in paragraphs 52 and 3 and 74. And unless one fails to see this, you cannot actually have a true revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to quote what Brother Branham says. Unless one sees this, the revelation of Jesus Christ fails. The Bible is a revelation of Jesus Christ. God himself revealed from word to flesh. In other words... God himself actually coming into manifestation, wherein God was previously a spirit, and he still is, of course, but not able to be seen. Man could not then have any concept of what God truly was like and what God truly did, his motivations and those things also which are with him. So it says here that God, that Jesus Christ is God revealed from word to flesh. In other words, the word became flesh. <clears throat> Brother Branham says, God is Word, or God is the Word, and Jesus is the flesh. It is a revelation of how, of how God the Word was manifested in human flesh and revealed to us. That's why he becomes a son of God. Now, right there, of course, it sounds a little bit ambiguous as to whether you're deciding whether God has become his own son or God in the office of sonship, or whether this one he's speaking of, that it's the flesh, body, becomes the Son of God. Well, actually, he's talking about the one in flesh. He is a part of God. The body is a part of God so much that it's a son. Now, we showed you that the other day. I don't know if I put it on the board or not. It's not really necessary. <clears throat> How that if you were to take the light that lies in the sperm and the egg, you could put it under a microscope and you'd never see that light. You could see the mm -hmm. egg and you could see the sperm and you could no doubt tell whether that egg was uh, uh, able to be fertilized because it was not a rotten egg. It wasn't, uh, in, you know, it, it was, well, that's what it really comes to. It would just not be able to, to take the light. And you could also see by the, the uh, movement of the sperm that there was a life there. But you could never get a microscope that would ever show the life itself. There is no way to visualize it or to ever apprehend it by the senses because life itself is invisible. <clears throat> However, you must understand this, that when you come to the formation of those cells, and those two cells going to form a child, that those cells have to be a part of that actual life. 
because that actual life is in there. And you're seeing a chemistry or a manifestation. You're seeing the chemicals which will manifest. So therefore, the body is literally a part of that life. And you cannot get away from it. Because if the life weren't there, there would not be a body. So it's a part of it. So when you're dealing with God, Brother Branham could categorically say that that body is so much God that it's a part of God. It is so much God that it is a son. And you could use the word, chi the word child. You're dealing with human beings, it can be male or female. You know, there's no problem there. But of course, in this particular instance, it is the, it is the son. It is des designated in the male gender. I know there's a there's a vast women's lib movement on now to feminize God, take away all fem all all the masculinity out of the Bible. Well, that's all right. You can emasculate God here in your thinking, but you wait till judgment. That's all right. I mean, it's fine by me. Women can do what they want. Men can do what they want. And God's going to do what He wants. Let's find out. Well, I'm going to throw my lot on God's land. You do what you want. But anyway, you want to go. It's no problem of mine. I got my problems. One by one, there's a confrontation. It doesn't say we're going to come on mass. Mass judgment is always down here in the world. God judges on mass. But up there at the white throne is one, one, one. Sheep come in one by one. Do what you like. I mean, I'm not hard and not, not tough up here. The thing is, look, I cannot control your lives. I'm not expected to control your lives. I preach a word. If that you've got something in your heart to listen, to take that, we're on the, we're on the same level then. You've got to rapport with each other, and by the grace of God, a rapport with God. But you can see where the body is so much a part of God, it is a son. And your children are so much a part of you that they are children. Amen. See, they, they are a part of you. What else are they if they're not a part of you? You tell me. See, the origin is there. <clears throat> That's a part. So it is with Almighty God in and, and the, and the production of this son. He also says in, in verse 20, in, in paragraph 74, to misinterpret Jesus. That's the man Christ Jesus now. Not, not, we're talking now about the, you know, the Father and Son have the same name. So you say, well, I'm going to talk about Jesus. I say, which Jesus? Father or Son? What are you going to tell me? Right. See, you know how it is that almost everybody likes the name? Well, I suppose it, it was a tradition. I don't say we have that same tradition where the fathers always wanted to have the Son named just like he was. Then you bring it down to John 1, John 2, John 3, John 4, and John 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. There's a long, long list of Johns going way, way back. That's fine, or Georges, or Jims, or <clears throat> anything like that. Now they kind of hide it in the second name, you know. They're, they're not, they're a little bit different. But we say, which one? Which Jesus? Well, the man Christ Jesus. Now he said, to misinterpret Jesus in the form of God in a man would make him, Jesus, one God out of three. And that's, that's really true there. <clears throat> if you were to misinterpret him and say, all right, now, this one here is God, and there's two more just like him. But this one here is called Son, and he's manifested in human flesh. And now, this one, these two over here, we're not. Now, I can understand where you might get two gods out of Scripture, but to have three is, is insanity. It's literally insanity, because God, Jesus said that God was his Father, and he said the Holy Ghost is his Father. The Scripture tells us that. Well, which, which, which one is his Father? Now, there's certainly, certainly the truth that a man could have, you know, uh, well, you're in nature here. How in the world could a woman have, have, have uh, two men as the father of one child? Now, she can have two children by, by, uh, one, by two men, and they can be, uh, you know, you know uh, uh, she could be carrying them at the same time, and they could actually come out as they did in Sweden and in America the same way, one black and one white, which proves that, you know, come on. There we, we have... We have uh, the genes are marvelous and the chromosomes, but they're not that marvelous. They came from two separate inseminations, that's basic. She had one in the morning and one in the afternoon, and, and that's, that's that's a literal fact. And if anybody thinks, well, hey, you're quoting from a foreign land, well, I can't quote as to black and white, but I can tell you the truth. There is a lady living right down in Beaumont, Texas, and we could find her name out. Uh, she, her pregnancies occurred actually six weeks apart by her husband. And she and the, and the, and the twin, twins and being born almost died, and she almost died. Because the one had, you know, the gestation, the period was through, <clears throat> the period of gestation, so the one was about to be born. It was either six, it was about six weeks, my understanding. My memory isn't, isn't that fast on it anymore because that's about 20 some years ago. So you can understand these things, but you come, you come to, down to this point here, <clears throat> you talk about uh, Christ having, uh, Jesus our Lord having two fathers, that's, that's ridiculous. He, he had one father by two appellations. That's what it was. 
one called the Holy Spirit, and just one, the cognomen of God. Now, now the next thing he says here <coughs> is uh, to misinterpret Jesus in being the Word, you make him one God out of three. And that's true. Again, once more you have to realize John said in the beginning was the Word, the Word is with God, and the Word was God. Now, the, now in the beginning with God is what throws everybody. But it tells you, frankly, the Word was God. You say, well, there it is, proves there's two of them. No way. <clears throat> no way. Because he said, I and my Father are one. Now, let's remember this. We, we get it back to the human aspect. Adam's body didn't make him any more Adam than he was in the Spirit. Amen. It did, it, he, was, he was Adam. And if he never had a body, he would have still been Adam. Now, remember... The law of multiplication was given to Adam and Eve when they were one person in spirit form. But it was only in physical form there could be manifestation. So therefore what we're looking at is this. You do not see light. There's no way you can produce it by a test tube or discovered by a microscope. Only in so far that you could understand it could be there. But you cannot see it. And so therefore whether there's manifestation or not, it doesn't make any difference. You can't deny it. It is still light. All right. We have we have then God. We have our human lives here. <clears throat> Manifestation comes by giving a body to it. And that body comes according to the attributes and the characteristics what lie in that light. It doesn't lie in the elements. No way, shape, and form. Although the elements do have a certain amount to do with it. That's true. We understand that. But the life itself is back there in a the spirit form. Well, you look at the same thing with with what we saw, what we see in our time, looking back to the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> what did God do? God reduced himself, that's the Holy Spirit, compacted it with all of the attributes, right, call them minuscule form, whatever you want to put it, just down to the very minutest where you can never even figure it. Because when you look and understand that the human egg and the human uh, sperm, there's a 23 chromosomes, 250 genes, the chromosomes come together, what? Uh, so many so many trillion times, 70 trillion times I think it is, the way you can come together, and then you get to the, put them all together, the chromosomes and genes, that's one with 9,031 zeros behind it. That's the way they can come together. And that's all compacted, although you don't get all of it in one child. It shows how they can blend in there and what lies there. Then what does lie in God? When God decided to reduce himself and put his life in the form of an egg and a sperm, just simple as ABC, what came forth? The body, a part of God. And the life of God was there, not your life and my life. That's a different thing entirely. This was not a created life that God made when he said, I'm going to create animal life and flora life and this kind of life, the botany life and the, <clears throat> you know, the animal life. And he, that's, that's, that's a different thing entirely. God reduced it. And I can see by looking at what's in nature and in man, you can trick it right back to God. And, there's, and it's not such a terribly hard picture to see. It's not so terribly hard to solve. And so now we see God in manifested form because that, that body was a part of him, and what does he do? He comes into that body because that's his own homemade body, as it were. Mary didn't supply anything but the, but the, but the uh, chemical facility. That's all. In other words, you want to put it down, she was an incubator or sort of a factory. You know, we're seeing the same thing right today. <clears throat> you got, you got, you got, you got what you have, a, uh, what do you call the fertilization in vitro. And you can, you can have where they'll, they'll take the sperm and the egg and put it in the test tube, and they say, hey, this is taking, this is fine, and put it in the womb. And then you can have a board room like Christ did, a board room and a board tomb. Some women cannot carry children, so they pay a woman $10,000, $20,000 to go through that for them. And, and I, it boggles my mind, and I think, it's, I, think it's, I think it's ridiculous, and I think it's kind of crude. But science once more proves God. Yeah. <clears throat> God doesn't make scientific statements, per se, he makes it spiritual. <clears throat> but if a scientific statement is there, you better believe it's right. Like, you know, you know like that four corner of the earth, nobody thought that was right. The astronauts got up here and proved it right. All right, now last Sunday, or last, yeah, it was last Wednesday, <clears throat> we were impressed by Brother Brown's message in, uh, as to the sovereignty of God. This is the same message. Now Christ revealed his own word. As the sovereignty of God in that, number one, it was exclusively God's book, not man's. We saw that. Number two, it was exclusively determined by God how it was written. Number three, it was exclusively determined who should receive this revelation, which is Jesus Christ. Number four, it was exclusively determined how that revelation was to be given. <clears throat> so we see not a lot of doctrine, but we see this one, God wishing to communicate himself to mankind. 
and the communication would have to lie in something physical because we are in the physical. If you want a real communication. Now, way back in the old days of the prophets, uh, God could appear in the pillar of fire, which he has in this age. And he could, he could appear in various ways, like on a cloud, and, you know, things like that. He'd speak out of a whirlwind and do amazing things. And live in a prophet, temporarily, very temporarily. Just, you know, uh, you can find that in people who are in, in, uh, in spiritism. You go to the island, especially Hades, one of your, one of your toughest spots for spiritism. <clears throat> and uh, I guess it's recognized as the world's toughest spot. And you know that people love to be inhabited by those spooks. And they think it's a great thing, they're spirits. And they think it's a great thing, you know, to be inhabited by them. And somebody may wander into your house and he's got a glazed look in his eyes. Now, he's not on drugs because drugs didn't obtain down there. It was just recently. This is a book I read many years ago. It was written by Seabrook many, many years ago when he traveled. over. a very brilliant author and a great, a great traveler. And uh, he mentions how the living down there, they sacrificed butter roosters and they went through all their voodoo and magic and how the Catholic Church are deeply involved in it, and uh, which it always has been. It takes this way and that way what it, what it wants to do because it's just... And always in a state of flux. No, no stability, see. It's like the bottomless pit, no foundation. <clears throat> All churches, same way. All churches, just, just word as that has a foundation, see. It's got it. And so anyway, these people then, because there's spirits upon them, and they're not under drugs, it's a, it's a not necessarily self-induced, but many times it is self-induced, not a hypnotic trance, but that's like a spirit trance. And if they come in your home, uh, they, they touch the food or something, that food is especially blessed. And they're into a spiritism. See, it's, uh, <clears throat> now, we, we're looking at this here, God having brought himself to a place of manifestation, some way that uh, he can be revealed. And in this book here, we find the mechanical uh, story or the mechanical draft of what comes into a living reality. In other words, the blueprint to the building, the, 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 the plan to the production of that plan. And so in here we see then <clears throat> that this God that was very vague to man, God has made us so that God is not vague to man any longer. All he's got to do is follow this blueprint here if it is properly understood. And in the understanding to reveal Jesus the Christ, to reveal God himself, who took on that human form, you'll notice it was exclusively God's own book, not man's. It was exclusively determined by God how it was written. Exclusively determine who should receive its revelation, which we found here is about Jesus Christ. And it was exclusively determined how that revelation was to be given. In other words, man did not have one thing to do with it. So we examine these four thoughts under two headings, particularly. Exclusively God's book and exclusively determine who wrote it. <clears throat> now that is right. Now God himself could have done it. The scripture tells us how that Jesus wrote in the sand. Scripture tells us how God wrote on tables of stone and gave them to Moses, which Moses came down in an anger destroyed. Tells us how a hand appeared and wrote in the temple way back there in the days of Babylon in, in the time of Belshazzar. <clears throat> it isn't that God couldn't write. And it's not that God doesn't speak because God did speak. And Israel so terrified, they said, don't talk to us anymore. We don't want to hear your voice and see the manifestation. We would sooner have a go-between. We would sooner have Moses do it. And so God said, very, very fine. This is exactly how it is all going to be done. I'm going to have a prophet I will deal with. Now, there's various kinds of prophets, but God only gives his word to prophets. And people say, well, I heard the voice of the Lord. You didn't hear the voice of God, even though your auditory nerve was touched and someone in the room would not hear. That wasn't God. That was your auditory nerve being touched. God only speaks audibly to a prophet. That's mouth to ear. I know many people are pulled pull aside on this and they say, well, I ought to know. Well, just say, please be my guest. You know what you know and do what you want to do. This is my apple box. This is the one I pay for. <clears throat> See, it is, is no way. There's no way. Search, search the scripture. You say, well, look, the thing is this. I don't use that scripture. Fine, then why do you talk about God? Why do you mention Jesus Christ? You want to talk about God and pantheism, that there's a universal spirit there. That's fine by me. You may even go to Mrs. Baker, Baker Eddy and say God is universal mind. That is still fine by me. No problem. No problem. But when she said there's no efficacy in the blood of Jesus Christ and the blood of a rooster, there's something wrong with her. Amen. She was not, and I, I, pan, I do not pan her epilepsy. But epilepsy is also a spirit in many, many cases. Sometimes it's by injury. <clears throat> but in many cases, 
people are simply with that spirit. Spirit gets cast out. That person is perfectly fine from that time on. But she was a very sordid individual. Tried to commit murder. Everything else. How much she heard from God, I wouldn't. I wouldn't give her a nickel's worth of my time. There's no way. <clears throat> they can believe what they want to believe out there. That's fine by me. But the Bible here, which we go by, declares distinctly: this is the word of Almighty God. And the prophets absolutely were the only ones to whom God communicated his word. And we'll see more about that as time goes on. In other words, this is God's word exclusively. It does not contain the word of man, which we'll see that later on also. God determined who would write it. And it is not a man coming and saying, Now look, Lord, I will, I'm, I'm here as your amnusis or your, or your secretary, your private stenographer or secretary. I'm not here one to copy down, so you talk to me. It's not that at all. God picks that man. We'll see that too also as we go along. Number two, the exclusivity, <clears throat> determined, exclusively determine who, who and how the revelation, to whom and how the revelation is given. <clears throat> now there again we see the sovereignty of God. He picked the prophet to give it, and only certain people can receive it. And we'll see more of that as we go along. So here we see this is like an exclusive club. And you know something? That is exactly what Paul calls it. The initiated. He said, those that, he said, this word cannot be given to anybody but to the perfect. And that is a word that is actually cultish. That's to the exclusive. And you, what it is, you're, you're perfect in the mysteries. In other words, you have an understanding which is spiritually given. But it does not make you, uh, it does not make you a Gnostic or belong to the Gnosis. The Gnosis read in between the lines. And they say, look, we, we, we heard something from God. And, and it's different from this here. It, it gives us more of a revelation. No, that's, that's not it. <clears throat> they had those in the first, first church age. They got them today. They're all over the place. See? But it is really an exclusive club. That's why the Bible says only the very elect are not deceived. Not just elect now, very elect. And the very elect only appear at this end time as they appeared at the beginning. Now, we're not preaching an exclusive club membership. Far be it. We don't talk of membership here as though this church could do one thing for you. Not on your life. Not at all. We don't say that. <clears throat> we're talking of God's exclusive club. The bride. Amen. See? Which were foreknown before the foundation of the world. And if your membership was not on, your name wasn't on the membership of that book, the last book of life, no matter how you would like to come to the exclusive club, you cannot get in it. Not one of us today have gotten this exclusive club because we got in it. We're already a part of it before the foundation of the world. That spirit life form, you see, that had to have a manifestation. Yeah. You already were. If you tell me you weren't, you're ridiculous. Where'd you come from? Your great, your grandfather, your great grandfather, your great grand, great great, your great great great. I'll put it back to what a hundred zeros. I don't know. I don't know how far six thousand years go back. <clears throat> and you'll see, you were there. And where were you before then? Okay, where were you? And you had that representation back there, or you don't have one now. Amen. Folks, it's a very exclusive club. Oh uh, yes, you had a foundation stone and a headstone. And it's all of one. All of one source. Absolutely. Don't make any mistake about it. <clears throat> Very exclusive club. See? So God has determined exclusively by himself how the revelation was to be given, to whom it was to be given, and then passed on, and who would receive it. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. As many as were ordained believed. Those who are not ordained were, could not believe. And Paul says, as many as are perfect. I wonder if I can find it over here. Just not too good a memory, you know, so you know you, you can't trust me too good when it comes to my memory. <clears throat> now, in verse 6 of the second chapter, how be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the prince of this world that come to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God to the perfect in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now you tell me this, at the end time they're supposed to crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh. Now, if it wasn't an exclusive club, so to speak, and pardon me for using the terminology, it's a bad terminology. If it weren't an exclusive bride with an exclusive revelation, do you believe? They would crucify themselves the Son of God afresh. No way, shape, and form. Amen. Any more than they did back there 2,000 years ago. <clears throat> no, that makes us nobody. I know people think that. Far out of this thing in their mind. You, you talk to a Christian, you think he, he thinks he's the lowest form of humanity in the world. 
He thinks he's the most degraded, worthless, no good piece of junk, except Almighty God looked down and said, hey. But the Bible said he takes the beggars off the dung heap and makes them princes. So if you weren't on the dung heap, then you never can be a prince. This is something like the old fable, you know, the turning, the kissing the frog turns into a prince. Uh -huh. God kissed the frogs, you bet he did. You got a bunch of princes out of the deal. Oh, I don't care. We could use a fable if you want. They used fables back there in the old, in the time of Peter. They thought they thought the, the Phoenix bird was a, was a legitimate story. <coughs> it wasn't, but it didn't. But it did illustrate the resurrection. <coughs> See, now this is Cruz of Club. <coughs> this is the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> now we're going to keep start reading and back here on on page uh, oh, I guess it's page twenty seven. The bottom paragraph. Your prophets did not under the prophets did not un always understand what they were writing or what they were saying. Now you see he's telling about the prophets, and we'll get a little more in this as time goes on. But now just take the word prophets. That's all you need to do. It's a seer, a one that can look down the road. All right, prophets did, and they wrote the Bible. Did not always understand what they were writing or what they were saying. They would in no wise have said it if they could have understood it. See. <clears throat> well, you say, what, what, how, how, how would that be? It shows you that this is God's writing, not man's. That they were merely automatons or robots, secretaries, forced to do what God told them to do, and had nothing to do with them. In other words, the secretary doesn't own the corporation. Amen. And she doesn't tell the boss what to do and what to say. And she better get down exactly what the boss said or she's fired. Amen. So saw so the prophet. Of course, the prophet has something built in the secretary doesn't have. Even though she might have a standard type machine and all little little things, she can work it out so fast. And even have a, or she could have a dictaphone, that would be wonderful. And secretaries do have dictaphones. So they can know exactly what the boss said. I'm going to tell you something. Those prophets were like those dictaphones. We'll tell you why as time goes on. <clears throat> now listen, Brother Brian said they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Move. When the Holy Ghost moves you, you move. Now, there's something about a prophet most people don't know. They think, well, maybe maybe that prophet, he's a prophet, but, you know, he sort of sits around in a half a daydream, and, and when he gets to a certain stage then, and they sort of sort of little daydreamy way, he gets himself sort of comatose in a little bit of a hypnotic trance or something, works himself into it, and then God speaks. That's a lot of hogwash. That's not how God does it. So let's find what Amos says over here. It says in verse Amos 3 and 6, Shall the trumpet be blown in the city, and the people not be afraid? Shall they be even in the city, and the Lord hath not done it? Or in other words, it says, and the Lord shall not do some, something about it, if there's evil in the city. In other words, doesn't God have his hand on it, his eye on it, know about it? Surely the Lord will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. And that tells you right there. Now watch the prophet. The lion hath roared, who will not fear? The Lord hath spoken, who can but prophesy? Now there he tells you, <clears throat> categorically. Yeah. A prophet is at the complete will and, dic and, and dictates of his owner, which is Almighty God. <clears throat> now, you know, the secretary can, can fail and get mad and quit. But not a prophet. And I'll prove it. Jonah got mad and he quit, but he couldn't. <laughs> so he can't do it. See, Bible lines up. Couldn't get away. Oh, oh, I think that's just a fable. Well, that's fine for me. Fable's fable. That's okay. I don't believe it's a fable. I believe it's true. Amen. Because we've seen vindicated that something is true about this book. <clears throat> no other book has. No other book has what this book has into manifestation. In other words, as evidence presented in a categorical manner showing that it lines with this. Not something obtuse and way out there in the foreign fields, my brother and sister. Not just pertinent and relative, but it. Amen. It. Not pertinent and relative to it, but it. A lot of people say a lot of things pertinent to and relative to. But it is a different thing. See? Certainly. <clears throat> now listen, when the Holy Ghost moves you, you move. Just like Jonah. God in sundry times and divers manners spake to the prophets that were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now that's a natural quote there. Now, that's why in all ages the people who are spiritual consulted the prophets about the times that were to happen. And the prophet writer must be in constant fellowship with the author. <clears throat> now, let's just take a little look over here past Amos. And I had a little note marked down on, on uh, Numbers. So we'll go, back and go to Numbers, the 23rd chapter. 
And this is about old Balaam, Balaam, Balaam back there. And uh, I want to see what he said about, about a prophet. <clears throat> because this king came to give him money to prophesy bad against Israel. And he took the money and went down to prophesy bad and ended up prophesying good. And he did it two times in a row. And, of course, King Balak got very angry. He was, well, no doubt you can understand. He would get very angry. You know? Here's what he said in verse 12. And Balaam answered and said, Must I not take heed to speak that which the Lord has put in my mouth? Now, I didn't say put in his mind. Because he went down there with his mind and his heart full of poison to destroy Israel, to curse them. <clears throat> and he couldn't do it. Now, watch the uh, 26th verse. But Balaam answered and said unto Balak, told, told not I thee, saying, all that the Lord speaketh, that must I do? Why? Why? He's his own free boss. I come down here, Lord, and I'll tell you one thing. You want me to bless this bunch of birds. I've been paid to curse them. Now, evidently, you will not let me curse them, so I ain't going to say nothing. I'm walking off the sea. He couldn't walk off the sea. Amen. <clears throat> now, come on. Read it the way it is. Don't just gloss over it. Read it the way it is. He said, I can't do a thing about it. i got to do what he said. Now you say, well, was the Bible written by that kind of an influence? Absolutely true. Yes. See, no problem there. <clears throat> now, uh, I read in Jeremiah the whole chapter. I'm not going to read it this time. But let's go to Jeremiah anyway. And that's the first chapter. And I think it's the sixth verse. Uh... Oh, it's one of the ninth verse. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. Didn't touch his heart, didn't touch his mind. And the Lord said, Behold, I put my words in thy mouth. I have made your tongue my pen. I have made your tongue my tongue. See, your mouth is my mouth. Now let's go to the fifth chapter in the 14th verse. <clears throat> the same book. Therefore thus saith the Lord of God a host. Because ye speak this word, behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire, and this people would, and it shall devour them. <clears throat> now, what does that mean? It tells you when that man has to get up and pronounce a curse of God upon the nation, that nation's gone. Amen. <clears throat> now, what's, what about America? So and I, don't, I don't just don't, don't choose to have Brother Branham as a prophet and, and said the things that he said, and, and, and so therefore I just turned aside and I just say God's a good God. That's what Eve said to you, that you died. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <clears throat> now you got to come to the place where no, and you're living in expectancy that this nation has the atomic bomb with its name on it, and Russia's going to hit it. It's going to hit the Vatican also. Right. You got to realize absolutely that what follows this message, whatever date comes, which I don't know, you don't know, it simply says this type of people shall not pass away. And so the doctors can try all they want, and the psychologists and the sexologists and try all they want. You're going to have your homos with their AIDS and their filth and their rot until Christ burns them all out. That's right. So put it down and put it down and leave it down. He said, I don't believe that. You don't have to believe anything. You don't have to believe anything. But you're going to be forced to one of these days to Amen. find out whether you believe it or not. That's right. Because every generation does eventually. I know they say, well, this was way back in those days. Sure, it was right back in Sodom. Do you realize how filthy homosexuality got? They were stricken blind. You see, I believe they had their eyes open. How come they couldn't see a door? Let's just say their eyes were really closed. And they were so wrought up in their lustful sins, they tried to find the door, to beat the door down. In other words, they were completely oblivious to what God had hit them with already to get their lust satisfied. That's read Rock Hudson's story. They took the wraps off. I read the first issue. That's enough for me. I don't need anymore. He couldn't be satisfied. Talk to these perverts. <clears throat> now, some I don't condemn. They were born that way. God had pity on them. I'm sorry for them. When they were born that way, there's hope for them because Paul says such were some of you. But when they deliberately go into it as, this, as, these, as these people have, and try to destroy their rest with their filth and their corruption, saying, you will find the third sex will predominate. I'm not interested. Amen. I will predominate. Amen. Because I'm getting out of here and coming back with the one who's going to reap the judgment. <clears throat> he said the words are going to be fire. That's so why I don't say I don't think I like the sound of that. Well, nobody likes the sound of those things, but you better listen to it. Because it's the truth. Now he said the prophet writer must be in constant fellowship with the author. Let's just take a look at that constant fellowship with the author. What kind of a man is he? 
this prophet. Now, Balaam was not a true prophet. He had a gift of prophecy, <clears throat> and he was a prophet out there in the world. And he was under an influence, the same as those prophets under Ahab were. An evil spirit got hold of him. Now, this was not an evil spirit with Balaam. Don't think for one minute that was. It's not so. <clears throat> but you've got a different story. Now, let's go back to see John here. Let's see what John said here. Brother Van spoke of fellowship. First uh, John 1, first, first uh, chapter of 1 John, the epistle of John. In 7 verse, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin, <clears throat> walking in the presence of God. Now, that's yours and mine here in verse 7. John was passing it on. But when you talk about the presence of Almighty God and a prophet, you are talking about the literal presence of God and not the baptism with the Holy Ghost. You are not talking merely about some little wave, some little emotion, something in the spiritual realm. But this is God himself. He's talking about being in the presence of God. He must live in the presence of the author to know what the book's going to be. In other words, he must be in a living contact with Almighty God, that that is his light. <clears throat> that the prophet does not have a gift of prophecy, but the prophet has a complete ministry, a complete light. He's born a certain way. God said to, to Jeremiah, Be, I knew thee before thou was formed in the womb. They are made a certain way. Their conscious mind and subconscious mind are so close together, they can blip out one into the other. They can go into a trance and a vision. <clears throat> it's been going on in the writing of this book. Remember the Apostle Paul had a visitation from God and received by revelation the epistles he wrote and identical to what Peter, James, and John and the other apostles had received by way of mouth from the Lord Jesus Christ here on earth. It was no different. Fourteen years he went back and checked up and was word by word and point by point. In fact, where they had laid down some of their understanding, he had not laid down any of his and rebuked them and made them ashamed. See, then what kind of presence did he have? He called the pillar of fire Jesus, which he was. He'd gone back to the form of the pillar of fire. See? <clears throat> That's why the body, the man Christ Jesus. If you make that, if you make that God, you have done despot to the word of God. You've got two gods right there. Forget it. The body is a part of. It had the life of. The attributes of. But the body was a man. The federal headship of Christ in contradistinction to the federal headship of Adam. See, that federal headship is a really kind of a silly word because the federal headship of Adam went down the drain a long time ago and the serpent moved in. See? Now, see, the prophet writer had the pen and was ready at any time and, and in constant fellowship with the author, which was God, to put down whatever he said to put down. See, showed what kind of a life he must have, a separate life from all the brethren. And that's exactly true. That's why we talk here of the sovereignty of God in choosing the men that he wants. And they have a special capacity. They're born a certain way for a certain hour, for a certain word, for a certain everything in the sovereignty of Almighty God. <clears throat> and all of those men over 1,600 years dovetailed him exactly what they said so he could bring a prophet on the scene today and show it all come together. And people didn't want it. Amen. And we'll see more of that as we go along. That's, now, that's why the prophet had his mind set constantly on what God said, not on what man thought. Now, that's his own thinking. <clears throat> See, a prophet's mind has to be amenable to change. Yeah. You say, just a minute. No, don't just a minute. Let's take the let's take let's take Moses. <clears throat> Moses sees a fire burning in the bush. He said, hey, he said, what is that? The reflection of the sun. He said, what's going on? He said, that that's funny. I never know anything like down in Egypt, and I had a pretty good education. But he said, there's a fire in that bush. That thing is not burning. Now that was in Moses' mind. There was no thought of God in that thing at all. He came over and then a voice for the voice said, <clears throat> he said, take your shoes off because you're on holy ground. He said, what in the world's going on here? He had his own thoughts about taking over Egypt. When God said, Moses, I'm going to send you down there and Pharaoh will not let you go with a high hand. No, no, sir. And you're going to have all these signs and wonders and he's going to get madder and madder, anger and anger, and he's going to get tougher and tougher and he's going to get rougher and rougher. And Moses went down there and turned the water into blood and the, and the, and the, the serpent, you know, that was a, the stake, the, the, the crook into a shepherd's crook into it turned into a serpent. I don't think it really turned into a serpent so much as it was a, you know, they thought it was that way. 
<coughs> not that it couldn't turn into one. Perhaps it would be possible. Aaron's rod budded. But I think Brother Branham one place did mention that that was an influence that God has set there. But there's one thing about it for true, that absolutely <coughs> the uh, waters flowed blood and different things like that took place. Well, now what happened? Now, when Moses showed the sign, uh, particularly that time, of the, of the hand and the, and the crook on the ground, <coughs> Pharaoh hardened his heart, got real angry, and sent him away. And he said, look, he said, you guys are going to make brick without straw because you're a bunch of lazy people. I've just been too good to you. And you know what Moses did? Now, there's no more on Moses' mind that word than nothing at that time. Because Moses and the elders went back saying, well, God, you didn't only not deliver the people, but they're in worse shape than ever. And God had to say, didn't I tell you that? Right. Amen. So the word of God has nothing to do with the human mind. And the human mind in gear can misappropriate and misinterpret the word of God, which it certainly does. <clears throat> How do you get three gods out of one God? How do you get three gods out of the Old Testament? You can't do it. You talk about the Elohim of God, then you might have a whole plethora. The next thing, we're all God. <laughs> and then God's in the church. Hogwash. God's in God. Amen. And this is the blueprint right here. Then you see God Logos. Manifested when he goes into action. Now we get somewhere. Now he said, separated light from all his brethren. Certainly, <clears throat> like Joseph, very peculiar to his, to his own people. Now that's why the prophet had his mindset constantly on what God said, not what man thought, what the age thought, what the church thought, what the kingdom thought, what, but what God thought. See? Now when there came a time <clears throat> for a decision or a judgment, he couldn't say, well, let me look this case over and I'll see what I come up with. Now Moses had been given the word of the Lord about don't you work on the Sabbath day. And a man went out and gathered some sticks on the Sabbath day to cook his food, and they brought him in and said, Now, Moses, we've got a little touchy question here. The man shouldn't be gathering sticks, as far as we know, certainly not to be cooking his food, because the food should have been cooked the day before, so he got complete rest. <clears throat> what are you going to do? Now, Moses had been given the word of God, but being a human mind, it was pretty tough to go through that word. Because the word was given, so therefore the word of God had departed in that particular sense. So he said, All right, he said, put the man in, 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 into custody, into... Uh, uh, isolation, and he said, then we'll go ahead and find out from God tomorrow. So he, Moses went before the Lord, and the next day, the Lord said, Moses, that he said, according to the word which you have written down there, the man must be destroyed. He's got to be stoned. Now, that was the punishment. You say, well, I, I don't think that's very nice of God. Well, it's you. <clears throat> what we think of God isn't the point. It's what God said. Amen. <laughs> He only expressed God's thoughts to word. In other words, what, what it was, God had thoughts, and the prophet put them in words to the people. Not that God didn't give his own word. He said, I put my word in your mouth. But it was the prophet that people got the knowledge. No other way. See? Because a word is a thought that is expressed. You got it now? The word is a thought expressed. So the prophet was waiting for God's thoughts. See? Now, when you talk of thinking, <clears throat> you always think in terms of, say, not trying to uh, get something original that you may expound upon it, but really when you talk about thinking, you, what you're doing is accumulating the data which you may have available and then making a judgment. See? Well, see, that's why man can't enter the picture at all. Because the word plainly lets you know what the data is or data, some people call it data, or facts, call it facts, <clears throat> then God makes a decision. It's all laid out before us. Now, that's what we understand. The word is the thought expressed in the prophet waiting for God's thoughts. And then when God revealed his thoughts to him, he expressed it in word. Thus saith the Lord. Not, thus saith I the prophet, thus saith the Lord. And that's exactly true. And that's what you find in Deuteronomy. When the prophet comes in the name of the Lord, you say, in the name of the Lord, this such and such a thing must take place. <clears throat> and when it takes place, now remember, God's a God of integrity. Someone say, well, just a minute, God might let something slip in there. Oh, come on now. If I had to deal with a slippery God, and a slippery devil, and a slippery bunch of people, 
I've done slipped out of control already. Forget it. I don't have any time for God, and you didn't even have any time for me. Because he lied to me. How can you impugn the integrity of God? If a man came and said, Thus saith the Lord, and the thing came to pass, <clears throat> when you yourself would not allow anybody to speak in your name. And how, how, how high up are we on the scale? Above the ant, well, above an or orangutan or something? I don't know if we even got that far. They're at least innocent because they can't be immoral. <clears throat> we're, we're, we're on the low scale. Now that's why they defied kingdoms and churches which to do so in their day was a death penalty. Who would walk up into a king's face and say, Thus saith the Lord, such and such a thing is going to happen? Like Elijah when he said, Thus saith the Lord, to old Ahab. The dog's going to lick up Jezebel's blood and going to lick up your blood too. Dogs will eat Jezebel and lick up your blood. That's what he said. <coughs> Jezebel got so mad she chased Elijah all around the country. Well, you know what? They threw her down. The dogs ate her up. That's a record. And the record of, the, of, the, of her demise was there before her demise. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> sure. Such and such. You would have your head chopped off if you did a thing like that. The church would put you to death right now for doing it. <clears throat> but these prophets were bold. You said the church wouldn't? Ah. I can tell you one thing. If the, if the Protestant groups had not gotten to the state they were in, and to the places they're at. Don't tell me the Roman Catholic Church would not have beheaded pretty well all of them by now because that was in their blood and never got out of it. Amen. Now the Protestants are right back with the Catholics and you watch what will happen when the Great Tribulation takes place because the pressure's on now already. <clears throat> the church right now, right today, can control any place it wants to in the world. Amen. It's got that power. See? Especially where you got your democracy because your democracy's have that vested authority that is going down the drain all and all, all along. You'd have your head chopped off and so on. Why? Why were these prophets so bold? They were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's why they became bold. They wrote the infallible word of God. See? Now, notice these prophets wrote the infallible word of God based on the predestinated office and ministry. <clears throat> Otherwise, they couldn't have done it. Couldn't have done it. There are special people for special work. Now, I keep remembering here, the title is Christ Revealed in His Own Word. And here we see Christ in the prophets. In other words, Christ was willing to give His life and stand with that word. Paul was a prophet, was, gave his life for that word. Peter gave his life for the word. There wasn't one prophet, but died for the word if he died. And then John was not able to be destroyed by the people, and he died not for the word, he lived for the word, and he died with the word, the same as the others did. Called off the scene by God. <clears throat> they wrote the infallible word of God. Why infallible? Because thus said the Lord, showed that they were able to be the mouthpiece of God. God's credibility lies at stake. There are many who tried to impersonate these prophets, such as priests and so forth. That's right back in the days of Korah, Dayton, and Byron. What did they do? They just messed up. That's all. They couldn't do it, as they could not be prophets. Because God had selected the man for the age and selected the message and even the nature of the man, what would go over in that age, what he could put over, and how he could do it. Now that's something right there that shows your predestination. With the nature of that certain man, now watch, he could blind the eyes of, of others. The words that that man would say, the way he acted, would blind others and open other people's eyes. Now that's true. <clears throat> if William Branham was a prophet, and I certainly believe that he was, how come my eyes are open to him and other people's eyes are blind and your eyes are open and other people's eyes are blind? Well, you say, I don't believe your eyes are open. Well, I believe they are. Oh, you'd have to wait and see. Amen. The evidence I've seen is lines up with the Bible. I don't know what else I could believe. Right. Now, they think I'm stupid to believe and, and say this is my last resort <clears throat> and, my, and my resources are completely gone now because this is that prophet. I have what he said, therefore I abide by it. This is my faith. My faith comes from this. This is therefore my life. And they said, oh, well, why don't you just stand back now? Because you see, something else could come along. And I say, if it does, I don't want it. That's right. I'm not interested. Well, they say, that's kind of foolish. Well, that's fine. The apostles were just as stupid. That's right. Jesus said, why don't you boys go someplace else? They said, ho, 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 ho. No way. We believe that you have the words of eternal life. 
You say, well, that was Jesus. What, do you think he's dead? The same one proved his resurrection, a man named William Brown, who said, I stand here tonight and I challenge you to bring me 24 of your worst cases. I guarantee he, for every single one, when did Christ even do that in his own flesh? But the same Christ, or another man's flesh, a prophet, did that thing. <laughs> when they wouldn't take up his offer, he went down the Mexican border and found a little, little, little Spanish girl, all crippled, the best, the best report I can get of her. She looked like a dish of cold cooked spaghetti. Limbs, everything all twisted in. So bring me a worst case, they brought her. Little 12 year old kid, nothing but skin and bones and a mess. A mess at that. Held her on his knee, I think. How long, I don't remember. Maybe, maybe close to two hours. They just keep singing, praying. Suddenly she screamed, jumped off his lap, fresh on her, ball, on her body. Many, many Amen. people saw it. That's not something I'm dreaming up, brother. Said that was seen and understood. Amen. Amen. Hmm? The dead were raised. Yeah. Doctor's certificate proving it. <clears throat> so, well, I don't ever heard of it. Well, you better hear it for now. Yeah. And I'll tell you why you didn't hear it, because your preachers wouldn't tell. Right. They're afraid of their pensions and a little bit of little scrawny things like the prophets of Baal, too fat a living. Well, get rid of your fat one of these days. You won't need to worry about a diet, brother, sister, too long. You'll find out. <clears throat> you find out. You told the line, you'll get mighty thin, but the, the, the fat ones will tow the line. You know, America got inundated by the blackbirds, and I think we've got the same thing right there in the spiritual world. See? He dressed the man in the type of dress that he was, the nature, the ambition, everything just the way he had to be, just perfectly selected for that certain people that he'd call for that certain age. <clears throat> yeah, people get stumbled over Brother Brown's language. I sort of dress it up as I go by, and I don't dress it up too much. Not that smart anyway. <clears throat> make the verbs agree with the nouns, do things like that, tenses and so on. Doesn't make any difference, really. They said, well, if he, if he was God's prophet, why didn't he speak the king's English? Well, I, didn't, I don't necessarily know God speaks English. I thought more like Hebrew. <coughs> He's not confined to the English language. Amen. It's ridiculous. Try to put it down to education. What about old Amos the herdsman? You don't, you don't have to have a prophet speak perfect English. <coughs> no way, shape, and form, as long as he tells you what the, what, what, what's right and proves it. Personally, I would put it this way. As long as he proves what he's going to tell you is right, who cares how he tells it? That's the big thing. If he ever proves, he's the one to do it. <coughs> As I tell you about my, our neighbor, Jerry, I mentioned him in this series already, but our friend John Timonoff next door to us, he never had much education. Oh, the big shots would come down from the factory, you know, and the, the, big, boy, you know, the big boys that had all the, the big degrees, which is fine, you know. It's, that's good to have those degrees if you can really, you know, make them work. <clears throat> they had the degrees, they'd come down, and they couldn't make the factory go. They called old John, he'd go a little bit, tinker a bit, tinker a little here and there, and think would go. How back up the big shots couldn't do it? Now, John wasn't educated. We asked him about our Bendix. He said, well, he said, Miss Avelli, he said, I, I, I've never tried a Bendix, he said, but I think if any man can make it, I can fix it. And he fixed it. <laughs> the experts couldn't fix it. Oh, best machine we ever had, those old front loaders, man, I tell you, you can't beat them. I don't care what anybody says. Oh, Westing out the slant front, you know. They lasted and lasted and did the most fantastic washes. You get these top two, two, fancy. Can't even, can't even dry the clothes spin anymore. That's the kind of guys you got inventing things. Then you think education's going to do something for God and with the people of God? Forget it. Amen. This man had to be a hill tuck Kentucky hillbilly in the vernacular to show up the world. Get away from that stuff that you're putting your faith and your trust in. That's the thing right there. This Laodicean age, so rich, so erudite. <clears throat> oh my, so one of their own eyes. We've got the education, our seminaries. They mean cemetery is what they really mean. Spiritually dead and corrupt. <laughs> See, Laodicea, rich and priest in goods, naked, wretched, blind, and don't even know it. <clears throat> this man come on a scene like that, vast knowledge, uneducated, seventh grade education, but as he said, he sure knew it was in the books. I'm not trying to sound me short. But the elect could not be deceived. He couldn't do it. Something greater than just healing revivals was in the, in the air. People didn't understand it. He said, well, I can't see it. They were blinded, that's why. That's Revelation 3. Jesus came the same way. Immortal God dressed in human flesh. Now, Jesus is that body we're talking about. And God came that way. As he had a body to work in as a prophet to give the word, so he now has a body to die in to give blood. 
<clears throat> I know people don't like the thought of blood. That's that's all right. They say it's heathen, it's this, it's that. It can be anything you think it is. It's fine by me. I believe in the blood. And I exalt the blood. And I get happy that the blood of Jesus Christ was shed. I'm mean, happy not in the sense that I was glad to see somebody die. Not that at all. But I'm very happy in the sense that I'm prospered by what he did. In other words, it's been committed unto me or passed over to me. I've become an heir through that. Now, the immortal God dressed in human flesh, and because he was born in a manger, in a stable full of manure, not a place to lay his head, born, people thought he had an illegitimate uh, name tacked him. They attacked the illegitimate name to him. All these things that he was. See, they said he was the son of a Roman soldier. <clears throat> Mary, they said it was just a, a lie. All these things that he was, and how he came up a carpenter's son, how he had no schooling, more or less, in the world, or there was in this world, he didn't have anything to do with it. None of this world's civilization, education, or anything, he had not one thing to do with it, for he's God. It would clash. If he tried to go to seminary somewhere and learn something that these churches were doing, why, it wouldn't even correspond at all with his thinking, for he was God. All right. So education, schooling, seminaries, and such things are absolutely contrary to the will of God. Now, that's spiritually speaking, not physically speaking. You need an education. How, how, how did Christ pick up the scrolls and read? Do you think that just because he God was in him at that, that, that he read those scrolls? No. God came later at the River Jordan <clears throat> and filled him. But he was the Son of God, and he had to learn. He learned obedience by the things he suffered. Yeah. He grew in stature. In wisdom and stature, in favor with God and man. It was a growth like every other human being. He went from diapers to what you call the knee pads, and knee pads to the long pads, was robes, of course. <clears throat> from a tiny baby to teenhood, to teenager, to adult, right down the line. That was a man. Yeah. That man at the River Jordan. The God came in the form of a dove and spoke, and the dove came and indwelt him, disappeared within him, because the form, the dove was just merely. A form wasn't a real dove, like a bird flying. <clears throat> it was in the form of a dove. Shape. You said, who saw it? Well, at least John the Baptist saw it. Okay, the whole educational system is contrary to God. See? What's he talking about? The world systems of education are not dedicated to God and the things of God. Amen. Even the seminaries aren't anymore, because they're teaching a lie. The majority of seminaries are teaching one, uh, uh, three gods <clears throat> instead of one god. And they try to make it three gods uh, formed in one. And they take a pitcher of water. They say, now here's three glasses. And they, look, it's the same water. And so we pour in glass one, two, two glass, and the third glass. Now the water's all gone. What about the pitcher? Mm -hmm. Who's that disappeared? Then you've got God amorphous. I can't see a god that's amorphous. I can't see him. I can't see pantheism. Hmm. No, you're not going to kid me on that one, brother. Sister, no shape form. I don't wave my arms and God's here. Breathe in. That's God. That. Forget it. Forget it. Forget it. Forget it. Forget it. <laughs> no, sir. He's person. <clears throat> now I got three persons, three glasses. What are we going to pour them back now? What do we decide to pour them back? What happens? <laughs> Nothing to pour it into. Uh uh. No. 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 Somebody's wrong. <clears throat> Somebody's wrong. There's just they're not. It's not adding up. The educational system takes you right away from God. Why? Because it's a revelation. See? Yeah, that's why some people. Why do you think Luther left the Catholic Church? Because the Catholic Church saw he caught something in there that the Catholic Church had that was good to build on hogwash. He saw them doing penance, and he said, "That's not it. The just shall live by faith." The revelation hit him, and he tore the world upside down, inside out, tore to pieces. Amen. <clears throat> it was a revelation. The Spirit of God did it. Great man, Luther. Though. I know people don't like Luther like I do. He, 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 we'd be buddies. Maybe funny daddies, but we'd be buddies. I tell you what. <laughs> be, he's my kind of a guy. Not that I pretend I'm like Luther. I don't really get that. I don't have his zeal. I don't have his knowledge. I am <clears throat> admiration. <clears throat> admiration by the tongue. Fantastic person. Revelation, he. And other Revelation is one of the greatest books ever written, right down the line. A pure. Beautiful, consummate teacher of the Word of God, as far as he could go. As far as he could go. That mechanics was just right. If that had been God's day for the rapture, he'd have gone. He'll go anyway now, see. Amen. <clears throat> because he's in that place, that, that land where, oh my, it's, 
Hey, look at look at that spirit being I talk. Here's Adam in a spirit form. We got these men over there in a spirit form. If you think with the with what you call a, a spirit body. They're not eating, not drinking, but they're they're perfectly sensate to the things that they can be sensate to. Are they diminished because they haven't got a body? Oh, they're the same beautiful people. Right. Gonna come back for another body. Well, praise the Lord. Get get to see these things. That and you understand God all the better this way. <clears throat> see? They're in harmony. The whole thing's in harmony. Every teaching away from God, everything teaching away from God all the time. When I hear a man say he's a doctor, Ph.D. Ph.D. You know what that is? I'm kind of embarrassed to tell you. But you know what, you know what, you know what Paul said? Paul said, all my thinking, my education was manure. He said. <laughs> and that's a manure head. Piled higher and deeper. <laughs> you want to know the truth. <laughs> No one's so bad, was it? <laughs> my X-rated sermons are going down again. <laughs> and he says, Al Al Q, you know what that is? I think that's a low living quack if you ask me the question. <laughs> you want to know the truth. Never heard of that one before, but about the best I could figure that one out. Because any man that any man that goes preaching for the word of God against the revelation, he's a quack and he's a low liver, I can tell you that. He's not living in heavenly place in Christ Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> it's not a man that's got the quantum theory or anything else in there. You know, some lively individual with a quantum theory. Not, not that. Now listen, he's educated himself that much further from what he really was called to do. That's right. Now I'm going to tell you something. <clears throat> Never forget this. God educated Adam. <clears throat> God educated his people in the beginning. Now remember... Adam named the beast. I want to ask you a question. Where did Adam drum up the knowledge of those beast names? Come on. <coughs> There's no man smart as all get out, and I don't care how smart. He can drum up any name. He can take the Greek and the Latin and something else. He can meddle around and mix around and say, well, I can see by this. That animal has such and such, and therefore I'll call him this. And that's a pretty good description. But Adam, out of a blue sky, by the, by the Holy Ghost, giving him the information, said that's a horse, and that's a cow, and that's a deer. Little tiny thing, ha-ha, that looks like a deer. That's another kind of deer. Yeah, that could be the Elon, the, the, <clears throat> the gazelle, and all these different ones. And there weren't any unicorns either. <laughs> no, they were one-headed. <clears throat> I mean, I'm sure there weren't any of those things. That's a, <clears throat> that's a name of an animal. I don't think he had just that one little horn. <clears throat> I don't believe that either. I never heard I never heard any. Uh, man can put a lot of things, you know, in there. That's, that's supposed to be a, a certain type of uh, an ox, according to a little translation. And if there was a unicorn, that's fine. There's lots of things are extinct now, too. The passenger pigeon is gone, man destroyed it. <clears throat> he educated himself right away, but God's got an education because he educated Adam, and that education is revelation. And you get educated in the things of God. Now, remember, we got this in the book of Psalms. The Bible says that Israel saw the works of God, but Moses knew his ways. Moses was truly educated. Israel turned down the education. Israel could see the wonderful works of God, but Moses said, I'm going to tell you what's behind those works. And they wouldn't stand still very long to listen. And when they'd listen, God would bless them and take them along the road, give them everything they wanted, and then they'd get away from God, the education would go turn toward the world, and what man had to say, and they lost out again. And I'm going to tell you, William Branham came on the scene manifesting the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of Man ministry, proving absolutely God in our midst once more, God in the prophet. God doing those things, the world said, well, that's great, why don't we love the revival, we love the healing, we love all these things, but we can't believe what you say is behind it. That's the whole truth, brother, sister. Amen. I quoted you, Moses. We're in the Exodus. What more? <clears throat> what more? We've got it all nailed down here. Yeah, absolutely. Now notice how they were now moved by the Holy Spirit. Now, that doesn't mean that educated men can't come in or don't come in. Look at Paul. I guess it wasn't a smarter fellow in his day than Paul who was Saul of Tarsus, <clears throat> educated under Gamaliel, one of the greatest teachers of the day, great, strict Hebrew, Pharisee denomination, and a, and a wise man. Now, I'm not some callow individual here that got the stuffed shirt because he had a lot of knowledge. He wasn't like old Hillel, that's why they came to Jesus and said, can a man divorce his wife for any cause? Hillel said, put her away any time you feel like anything goes. Is that a fact? And why didn't Adam divorce his wife? Why did he love her and stick with her? I just can't, well, I, you know, you know my feelings on that. <clears throat> I came out of Canada when, back when they were when they were rigid conservatives up there. Man, you got 
got shot if you post something. They could find you. <laughs> you talk about your old jokes down here in your south and all, but they had, we had them in Canada. <clears throat> Brother, they were strict. I came out of strict, strict, strict. They got a lot of sin up there. Now, not that we didn't have sin, too. Don't misunderstand me. But our education was strict, Brother Sick, very strict. So they had this great man, not like Hillel. This was Gamaliel, very great man of God. <clears throat> Paul was brought up under him. He knew all the Jewish religion. But when he came to the church, Paul said, I never came to you with the education of men, and so forth. He said, I counted but dumb. And forgetting those things that are behind. And he warned them, don't get the veil of Moses over your face. What was Moses? Moses wasn't any veil. It was what Moses taught was a veil. Then it, that was not the real truth either. The real truth is what they taught about what Moses taught. <clears throat> That's where you can go haywire preaching when you're around. That's why I like to take it word by word and bring everything to your attention. So we're not getting off one word by the grace of Almighty God. He said, I never came to you in the education of man and so forth, because if I had, then you trusted in that. But I came to you in the power and manifestation of the Holy Ghost that your faith might be in God. What's he trying to tell you? A vindicated word. Paul, the apostle, was vindicated before he gave a word. So therefore, the word he gave was vindicated. Vindicate the man is to vindicate the word. Vindicate the word is to manifest God. To manifest God in this hour is the Son of Man <clears throat> in full view. Why? Because the words of a man don't do that. Amen. Right. <clears throat> How could Brother Brandon sit with me at the table that day having lunch up there in, uh, not Vero Beach, but um, Juber? There you go, yeah. <clears throat> Florida. That's on the highway number one, the west coast up there. The east coast, baby. Right. And uh, he said, you can just, he, got, he said, did you, you, you know something there, Brother Bill? I said, no, what, what, what? I didn't notice anything about that. Well, he said, I just had a vision of your wife. <clears throat> Now, he said, when you get home, he said, you'll notice, he said, you will grab up the motel. He said, the lady that runs the motel will be hanging close. Your wife out there will be talking to her. Then he said, she'll start to walk away, and she'll come back. And George Rhines will roll down the window, and we'll start talking. And there's something on her mind, and I'll tell her about it. Did it happen? Absolutely. Right. Well, how do you know? Same thing, he knows what he said right about the rapture and all these other things. The vindicated man has a vindicated word because God is manifested and ready to be revealed. And already the revelation in manifestation was the Lord Jesus Christ, and now to give his word, which is the great thing. And people say, well, I'll just talk about Jesus. How can you talk about him without the word? Amen. How can you talk about him unless your word is right? Because Paul said, there's another Jesus they'll preach. Jesus said, another will come in my name. And the Jews say to us, who were formerly Trinitarians, they'd say to us at that time, which one of them gods is your God? Who would better English, which one of those gods are? Happens to be your God. <clears throat> All right. Now, there you are, that's right. Many tried to impersonate these people, that's the prophets and the revealers, but they get things all messed up just like they do today. There was one raised up before the time of Jesus and led 400 people off. Now, you remember that's in the Bible. Gamaliel brings it up. And you know how the scriptures reads about these things, trying to do it before the time had come. <clears throat> now, we had a man named Dow. He rose up with a great ministry. And a man one day went to Dow. He had his dying city up there outside of Chicago. Dying city of North. And said to Dow, he said, you know, Brother Dow, I'm sure that you are Elijah, which was to come. And he said, I grew very angry. I sent the man away. He said, yeah. But he said, the more I thought of it, the more I began to realize that was correct. Dow, he was not Elijah, which was to come. Now, if William Branham comes in that scenario, and he says, I am that one which he declared that he was specifically in New York in, uh, one more time, Lord, that was, what, in 64, November 64, something I think it was, it was three, I forget, <clears throat> four, I guess, but declared who he was. People say, well, there you are. We've had these Elijahs before, and they discredit the fact that Elijah must come. Now, the question is, is what are the earmarks? What are you looking for? And you talk to people, they don't know what they're looking for. They just know that this couldn't be it because, you see, it hasn't occurred to me. Yeah, and after all, if I'm not Elijah, well, mm -hmm. you see, Jim, I am nothing. Mm -hmm. you know, like, oh, brother. It's like, I haven't got a hunchback to look behind your back and see how hunched it is. You know, cover up. Just cover up hypocrites. Hey. Cover up hypocrites, that's all it is. The whole church is a full hypocrisy. Get with it this morning, brother yeah. sister. Get with it and understand it. 
Amen. The church is full of hypocrisy. Pride. You see, it can't be. Then you're a liar. Because you're making God a liar. Because the Laodicea says, rich increased in goods and don't lack a thing. He said, wretched, miserable, blind, naked. Then they're liars. Amen. That's right. <clears throat> I want to believe it. Sure, Dowie came, but he wasn't it. Joe Witness preached the presence, which is the appearing. Now that it's come, well, we must be wrong because we believe it. Now I'm going to tell you something. That everything anybody believes today is wrong because it's already been preached. Then why talk about God? Because here's what they base it on. <clears throat> Even the Roman Catholics are stuck because for the first time they can all have Bibles. Mr. Pentecost got the Bibles in there. Now, it's not only the Roman Catholic Church that we don't have a Bible. We are the Bible. We are the church. We are this. We make it up as we go along. <clears throat> well, why doesn't the Pope do something for a change except stupid little politics? He couldn't even save that poor little priest up there in Poland and didn't want one of the two. I don't know what happened. Or something, something went haywire. Why did you do something? Some little sign, even. Right. Mm -hmm. Throw a ball in there and watch it hang there. Fat for good spirit, will pull that off. Let them go to this word. <clears throat> They're going to do it. Jesus says, search the scripture. For in them you think you have eternal life. He said, you've got it figured out that you're the ones that got it. And he said, you're going to find it testifies of me. And he stood there and he's appeared to the Gentiles in the last age in the form of the Holy Spirit done the same thing. <clears throat> you're not going to understand it. There's no way. Some of them tried to impersonate him. That's Jesus Christ. And they were all this and that was the other one. And Jesus said in the last days how they'd raise up false Christ in the last days. That's right. And false prophets and show signs and wonders. And we have that. <clears throat> now, what's a false prophet? A man that is false to the word that's got all kinds of signs and wonders. Just like old Balaam back, Balaam, Balaam back there. Mm -hmm. You said, you mean to tell me that a man could actually have the Spirit of God anointed and tell those things and him be false? Absolutely true. What about Judas? The Bible said he was the devil. And he went on, healed the sick and raised the dead. Now, don't tell me he didn't, because the Bible says he did. Now, you say you believe the Bible, then you got to believe that. Say, well, I think that just got slipped in there. Then what else got slipped in there? Right. Right. Go right back to a slippery God. <laughs> a slippery word, a slippery... Who needs it? i got to have rock bottom. I'm getting out of here one of these days. I'd let get her quicker than I'm getting out of here. But <clears throat> that's just not how it works. I've got full assurance on the other side it's just fine. I'm ready for it, and it's not ready for me. Evidently, something's holding up the plan. I have a reservation in, but I don't know what happened. I know, I know nobody's checked out. <clears throat> I know the room is there. Got no problem with that. Just the date hasn't arrived for the convention. That's right. Because you'll see people up there you know. Amen. That new dimension we're coming into, sure. Prophets, false, false to the word. Ain't no doubt about it. Lying spirits get a hold of them, too. <clears throat> they can do everything but stick with the word, brother, sister. Let's understand that plan. Now, we've already, there's, before there's one counterfeit, there must be an original, or the counterfeit is the original. That's right. Amen. you got to hit it right on the head where it belongs. All right, we've had it in our day, and Jesus said there would be a true, the evening light would come, and then the false would come right after it. All right, now, we are well aware of false prophets, but do we realize the whole body can be false? We can have false teachers, we can have false pastors, we can have false evangelists, we can have false apostles, and we got them. <clears throat> you say, well, do you believe there are people around this, this message that could be in that category? I, I don't think I've got much done to tell you the truth about some of the stuff I've run across. I can tell you people are still back in Pentecost teaching Pentecostal stuff, and they can't, they can't move away, but they're still legal. <clears throat> they don't understand the grace of Almighty God. Advances? I don't know where they are. No doubt they're around there somewhere. Where are they? There's true ones and there's wrong ones. Now then we realize that God sent his prophets. <clears throat> we realize that it was God that sent his prophets. That was the way he had of bringing his word to the people through the lips of his prophets. And notice, you know, Moses said, if you want to read it, Exodus chapter 4, 10, 12 verses, Moses said, when God spoke to him, God talked to a man, lift to ear, and Moses said, I'm slow of speech, Lord. 
I'm not sufficient. I can't go. Now, I want you to notice something here. All the way through, Brother Branham points to his own ministry. It dovetails with the prophetic ministry of every age. God said, who made man to talk or who made him dumb? That's what the scripture says. Who made him to see? Who made him to hear? Didn't I, the Lord? God said, I'll be with your mouth. Didn't Now, that's right. Didn't say, I'll be with your brain. <clears throat> Didn't say, I'll be with your hand. Said, I'll be with your mouth. So, therefore, when God was with the prophet's brain, that was just fine, but that wasn't it. And when God was with his hand, the signs and miracles and all, that was fine, but that wasn't it. It was God giving his own word without man having a clue to it, an understanding of it, any part whatsoever with it. I believe God even gave him the divine energy. I believe he did. <clears throat> See? In other words, they heard themselves talk. Jeremiah said, if you want to read Jeremiah 1, 6, God put words in my mouth. See? He talked lip dear with one prophet, spoke through other prophets he, who had not control at all, so God spoke, spoke, spoke through his lips. In other words, he's telling you the prophet does not have control. That's, now let's face it, brother, sister, that may sound very radical, but be honest with me. Isn't that the only way that God could actually get his own word over unless he wrote it out on a rock or something? <clears throat> you say, well, why didn't God do that? Because it was a sovereign purpose to do it this way, and you and I don't have a clue or a chance when it comes to sovereignty. Right. Some preachers came by at eight and abetted by a guy two years ago, and I really blew my coup, and they tried to tell me to ride herd on preachers. I'm, I'm supposed to set myself with some authority and ride herd on preachers. Let me tell you something. I don't even ride herd on you people. Amen. I'm just glad you're here listening to me preach so I can share these things with you. You love me and I love you and we love people enough to get message out and help people. <clears throat> but I don't have any authority over anybody. And if I tried, I'd have to bring you the word because that's where the authority lies. Amen. And if I didn't do it because I loved you and you needed it, <clears throat> then I'd be a hypocrite. So he came and tried to make me ride hurt over people. I don't ride hurt over anybody. But God rides hurt over his word. Amen. Because God's in a different category. Like he said in the book there, <clears throat> where is that? In the Proverbs, he said, uh, he said, don't give the sacrifice of fools. He said, because you're on earth and God's in, in heaven. Therefore, let thy words be few. In other words, you shoot your mouth off, you pay a price. But if you use the word of God, the confession of Christ, which is that word here, then you're on good ground. And if you combine faith with it, you're on a better ground. Then if you let love operate it, you're on the holy ground. You become a real temple of Almighty God. See, all these things work out, Brother Sister. That, that, that's the only way God could do it, is take somebody in complete control. <clears throat> well, I could tell you experiences I've had, and I'm no prophet, and I can understand perfectly. Absolutely God would do it this way. What other way could he do it? Mm -hmm. No other way. Unless, as I said, he was going to write it on a big rock or something. And the next thing come along, who is going to tell us the hour we're living in and the scripture for this hour? Like nobody knew when Jesus came here to fulfill the word of God of Isaiah 53 that that was it. Nobody knew. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God. Oh, they said, Come on, what are you talking about? Nobody dies for anybody. Lamb's a lamb. Don't know what has the word of God told us. Don't make your children pass through the fire and don't sacrifice unto me a human life. Then you come along and try to tell us we're going to have this man as a sacrifice of blood. Get out of here, you're crazy. Well, they'd blow the guy plumb out of camp without a revelation. And you yeah. think we wouldn't do the same thing today? And the churches have done the same thing today. That's why we should really pity them and have sorrow for them. I get pretty crusty up here when I'm alone in my thoughts and I simmer down. I've got no problem with anybody out there. I'm sorry for them. Yeah. God doesn't reveal it. How are they going to get it? Amen. Amen. See? Oh, Jews, I'd have gathered you with my prophecies. I brought the word, but you wouldn't listen. I'd have brought you like a hen takes her chickens in a time of storm needs a shelter. <clears throat> yeah, a bunch of chickens. But the eagles are going to get out of here on the wings. Right. Oh, yeah, I'm going to quit now because time's up. Time for you. I talk the next four hours. You just run up and you run on me. Love you deeply. <clears throat> Appreciate you very much. And we'll start again uh, maybe Wednesday if I'm around here. And I'll put a little little word here. What's the 20th? the 22nd today? Okay, June 22nd.
We're in right here, talking about Jeremiah. And, you met, and we're ending with the thought here, how that, what other way could God do it? <clears throat> you know, if he's going to use some person, something, outside of a strictly inanimate, and then if he used the inanimate and did it, then how is he going to get it out someplace else? Well, oh, come on. This brother said, you see the wisdom of God? Amen. Why, there's, you got to admit there's no other way it really would work. Just like Brother Brown said in that beautiful time, of, uh, uh, what is it, Matthew 5 and, and 48, he said, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And the union said about it, so privily. No theologian ever put it that way. He said, God demanded perfection. If God demanded, then God's got to make a way for it. And he said, and the blood of Jesus Christ scatters sin until there be no evidence. Then how can you make a man a sinner? Perfect before God. How could he do it except by prophet? How could he have a prophet except to be some manifestation? How could, how could we receive except someone was sent to us? And how could the man be sent be any value unless there was someone to be sent to? Right. Paul thing starts up in there and comes down here, and one day it's going up to come back to perfection. That is, I mean, the physical, the whole thing. You love the Lord this morning? Amen. Amen. See how beautiful it all works out. Simplicity, simplicity galore. Just like picking grapes off of the vine. Even, even my collie dog could do that. wonder where the grapes are going. <laughs> Caught the dog taking the grapes. I don't call anybody dog here. I'm just saying, hey, look here, brother, sister, when it's laid out before you, and it's out here in nature, then what's the matter with us not taking the good things of God, the fruit of the vine of God, <clears throat> the love of God, the word of God, and placing it in our hearts by the Holy Ghost and going one day back to him. Let's rise and be this morning. <clears throat> Gracious eternal Father, Loving Lord, we appreciate you so much this morning. Your lovely spirit amongst us, Lord, with no bitterness, no guile, no sorrow, no threatenings, no recrimination, none of these things, Lord, but a spirit of love and a spirit of light and the grace of Almighty God pouring through us, Lord. We believe wave upon wave, taking us higher, Heavenly Father. Let us not lose this moment, Lord. Seal it to us by your blessed Holy Spirit. Help us to lock it deep within our hearts and our minds, Lord, and just be thoroughly satisfied. How beautiful, how simple, how much God it is. Just like we know that that one that was born here and died for, shedding the blood, a part of God, so much so it's a son. And Lord, so much so this word is our life, inundating us, illuminating us, bringing us all down to a place of the grace and glory of God as never before. Father, bless each one amongst us. They're sick amongst us, Lord, heal them. We all need healing. We haven't, Lord, spoken so much of that in these messages over the years, Lord. And we don't want to denigrate it. We don't want to lose it. We realize that it's, we don't want to major on a, on a minor, Lord, but we certainly don't want to lose the minor. For you said not one jot and one tittle of your word would pass away. Therefore, how could healing pass away? Couldn't do it, Lord. And we're, we're just confessing our faults this morning and our lack of, in, of indulging ourselves in your perfect grace, O oh God. Forgive us, we pray, Lord, and help us to set our hearts and our minds once more for this grace of healing, Lord, that we might be all healed. And, Father, we know there's something even greater than that healing. And that is how the healing takes place. And that's from the soul outward to the spirit and to the body. As John said that you may prosper and be in health as your soul prospers, O oh God. And truly, Lord, in heaven we desire that. <clears throat> there never was a time when the, when, the, when the church was so prosperous with that light that's come in. Because now is that end time. Headship is returned. And the same light in the beginning has now settled upon us at the end. And, Lord, here we are. We just... And it's settling upon us, Lord, to mature us, not to go like a lion and convert the world, but to mature, dry out a bride, and make her solid wheat before you, Lord, in your very image. Father, we love that. And so, Father, how can we not then look at that and believe that we have all these things in there, Lord, healing and the atonement, all the grace and all the divine wonder. Oh, God, this morning, spur us as never before to lay hold of our claim to be solid, Lord. I, I know your spirit's moving this morning, Lord, to that end. And I pray, O oh God, we shall not miss it, Father. As the prophet so often said, people out there are missing the visitation, and they could be healed, Lord. And some did miss him. So many did, Lord. But this morning, Father, we don't want to miss the beauty of your word maturing Amen. us. We don't want to miss the understanding of your word, putting us in the place of this love and this faith, O oh God, to get the best out of life. And that best out of life is your moving in our lives, Lord, and doing for us. O oh God, we, as we see your sovereignty, we place ourselves under your sovereignty by faith this morning in love. And believe you, Lord, hopefully as never before. And if, we're, if our mouths are not true with this, O oh God, fill our hearts with something so it will be true. That this is a never-before trust, Lord. It is a never-before in some respects, Lord. That is true. 
because we have the revelation. But now we want to go all the way because we know the prophet never gave up on the healing of the sick. He said, my ministry is to go out there and he prayed for the sick. So, Father, that's true. We believe that that ministry that's, has never failed and it's not going to get away now. There's help for every single one more. There's physical help. But on top of the spiritual, we know the spiritual is so wonderful. And there's even financial help, Lord, for there too. So, Father, this morning we pray not to get our eyes on the obtuse or the minor, <clears throat> but, but realizing it's all there. May we walk in the light as you're in the light, having fellowship with the word being fulfilled in the people. These mercies we ask. These graces we, 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 we want. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. If the Lord bless you. We're just going to sing, take the name of Jesus with you. Take the name of Jesus with you.